Thank you. Thanks, Carol, for um, having me once again. And thanks to all of you for, for coming. Appreciate it. Um, like Carol said, I, I am going to talk about kind of how the book came about and how I decided to um, choose the buildings that are in the book. Um, to give you an idea of what the book is before I do that, um, 100 Years, 100 Buildings means just that. So it's the last 100 years are from um, 1916 to 2015, because I wrote it in uh, 2015, and it's one building per year. Um, and partly I, I did that to, um, to kind of have a, build, or have a book that is not just a history, not just a collection of contemporary buildings, and not just a, a travel guide, like the first book that I wrote. Um, those aren't the only books that architects can write or, or people can write about architecture. Um, but those are ones that interest me, and this was kind of a way to mush them all together. And I say a guide because each one of these buildings is um, one that you can visit. Um, so it, it came out in October last year. Uh, I was busy writing another book, so I didn't do any sort of uh, book talks at the time. So this is the, the first and maybe the, the last um, for this book. And um, I was pleased that the publisher, Prestel, after I signed the contract with them, uh, decided to also do a German edition of the book. Um, kind of ironically, though, they did not want this project, the House Schmidtke by Hans Scherun, uh, which is in Germany, they didn't want that on the cover. They felt like that um, was familiar enough in their country, so they went with um, this building in Birmingham, England. But the book did not start out as a book. It actually um, was a reaction to, uh, this was January 2015, and there was kind of this Facebook meme that at least some of my friends were, were passing around. And I didn't do it, I looked at it, I started to do it, but I didn't finish it because um, it was one of these 100 places you have to visit before you die sort of thing. And this, Facebook back in early 2015 was these sorts of memes. And then they changed their algorithms to make it more of a, a news-based, um, you know, have those kind of posts showing up on your wall or more personal things that your friends were posting. But anyways, so to me, all of these, these places, Statue of Liberty, Stonehenge, seemed just too obvious. I thought, what about the places that I'm interested in? So I thought I'll make a list like this put it on my blog, and you know, then kind of throw it on Facebook as well and see if anybody, um, you know, how many places people have been to. And then I thought, I started to put a list together and thought, how do I decide what those 50, 100, whatever buildings are? So that's when it kind of hit me that I'll do 100 years, but I'll do one building per year. Um, and I would do it based on when that building opened to the public, or when it was completed, or some other important milestone that said this is when this building was done. Um, so that kind of gave me this, this rigid criteria that I had to follow, and it meant that there might be two buildings in one year that would otherwise be in a book or a list of 100 buildings, but in my case, only one would do, so I'd have to kind of make these value judgments throughout. Um, so that was in, in January, and um, I, you know, these are some of the references that then, but also later, that I, I started to, to look at. Um, and I'm just kind of putting it up here for a couple reasons. One is, is this not widely known series that uh, was edited by Kenneth Frampton. He didn't do any of the writing, but he was the general editor of it. So it was 10 volumes, um, 10 regions in the world. It, it did 1900 to 2000, had 100 buildings per issue. And it tried to evenly distribute them. Every 20 year chunk would have 20 buildings. So it wasn't as rigid as mine, but it was um, kind of trying to survey the whole century. Um, and then there was actually a book that I came across after I signed the contract with Prestel, which was called 100 Billion Buildings, 100 Years, 
that did the exact thing that I was doing, but it was published by the 20th Century Society in Britain, and it was purely focused on preservation. So uh, this was kind of their argument for preserving these buildings that might uh, need some attention, or just drawing attention to ones that were saved, uh, in many cases, through their help. Um, and then also, this was a book, 100 Years of Architecture, that um, I saw a early uh, PDF of as I was writing the book, but thankfully it kind of just reinforced a lot of the, um, the buildings that I selected to have in the book. So this is my final spreadsheet of the 100 buildings, and everything from the, uh, this line to the left are the buildings that are in the book, and then these are what I call the runners-up. And in the book, at, at the back, are actually up to four or five on each year that were contenders or runners-up. Um, and I wanted to kind of show that um, in a lot, of, a lot of years, there's these other buildings that are also worth visiting, worth seeing. Because again, the idea was to put together a list of buildings that um, people should go see. And I'm one of those people because these are not 100 buildings that I have been fortunate enough to, to go to. Um, a lot of, I would say, maybe half and half. Half that I've been to and I would tell people, go see this. Half that I haven't been but are kind of on my list of, I need to go see that. Um, you know, in the latter case, one that always comes to mind is Jeffrey Bawa's um, this Kandalama Hotel in Sri Lanka. Um, just a, a beautiful building that's kind of built into the rocks and looks out over this, this lake. Um, I don't know if or when I'll make it to Sri Lanka, but um, you know, that's kind of um, in there for that sort of reason. Um, but you can kind of see some of, um, at least on the right side where these runners up are, um, how kind of the, the ebb and flow of um, architectural production happens over the course of the century, or the century that's, that's in the book. So you have World War I, kind of have the uh, Depression, World War II, and then the 70s and 80s, and that's somewhat a reflection of my taste because I lean toward more modern design, and that's kind of when postmodern design, postmodern architecture was um, more prevalent. Um, and just to give you an idea, um, all these columns are, are like the year, the building, I rank or um, included the continent, the typology, um, and then actually made a note of what is that year? Is it um, when it opened to the public, when it was completed, construction, um, some other milestone, and then where did I find that out? Because it's amazing how hard it can be to pin down a lot of times an exact date for a building to be done. And so as I went through, um, and actually the, this was uh, January um, 2015, so the ones highlighted were kind of the, the obvious, the Villa Savoie, the, um, some other aren't coming to my mind right now, but um, you know, the, say, Garrett <coughs> Reitfeld's uh, Schroeder House, things like that. And um, so those were kind of the, the first ones in, and then it was in uh, February that I got an email from a friend of mine, a photographer, uh, saying, I know somebody at Prestel who's looking for people with book ideas. So I scheduled a meeting and came in with this idea, which again was not intended as a book, uh, a couple other ideas, um, and she honed in on the one, you know, 100 years. At the time, it was not exclusively buildings, so there might have been, say, in here, uh, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in D.C. by my Lin, but eventually that came out because going back and forth with Holly, my editor at Prestel, um, it was kind of just really getting these objective criteria down. You know, it has to be an existing building, it has to be one you can go visit. Um, but 
who's to say it's not a landscape versus a building? Because like my New York City guide is open to landscapes as well as buildings. It's not seeing architecture as exclusively buildings. But then that kind of, um, you know, then the book moved towards 100 years, 100 buildings. Um, and that's when that criteria came in and certain things came out. So over time, kind of added uh, the building slowly, and it, it probably took a good, um, I think it was end of July in 2015, that I had the final 100 down. Um, before that, I was working with the editor and people at Prestel to get photos, because that's um, you know, one of the things with these, this kind of book, is, is getting really good photos for each building. Uh, this one has only one or two, but in a lot of cases that can be very tricky and um, not necessarily something that could fit into a budget very easily. Um, so let me make sure I'm just touching on, on everything. Um, I'm already kind of at the more the, the next part of the, the talk, which is kind of looking at a few examples, about 10 of them, um, and seeing um, just kind of what, what they say, or, and then we're gonna, well, I'll just jump into that. I can't find anything in my notes about, um, but maybe this is a good time if anybody has questions on the making part of the book. Did you select the photograph yourself? Uh, went back and forth with the editor. So um, I'll admit my, my tastes lean to um, seeing people in spaces. Mm -hmm. And um, I've selected a lot that reflected that. But my editor was kind of on the other, other side of things. And you'll see one later on that I liked her not so much. Um, but they were also the ones paying for it. It was their budget, their photo budget. So it was, I could only argue so much. Um, I could argue better if I was able to get a free photo. You know, one from a friend, or for example. Um, but the, the ones highlighted here are just the ones that I'm going to uh, talk about. So, um, and then geographically, this shows, it's kind of light, but it shows the distribution of the projects throughout the book. Um, and then the ones that are a little brighter are the ones that I'm going to talk about now. Um, but that was one thing while making the book, was um, how, at what point is uh, enough Corbu buildings enough, or enough Louis Kahn buildings, or uh, et cetera. And so I, try to get in some geographical diversity um, as well as you know, going back and forth with my editor, trying to get more women architects into the book, for example. Um, not always so successful, say, in the early years of the 20th century, uh, but something I tried to do. And, um, but even in terms of geographical diversity, you know, there's, there's kind of a big empty spot that's you know, right there, just one, one project in, um, in Egypt and Africa. Um, but anyways, so uh, the book starts with, with Holland House in uh, London, which um, I talk about the fact that um, kind of amazing that a building, something this significant, this is um, um, H.P. Berlage, you know, that something like this happened in the midst of World War I. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that the Dutch were, were building it, so they were neutral. And this was built for a shipping company. So when the company was making their shipments back and forth across the, um, the water, they prioritized the shipments of the building materials for this, for this building. So that's kind of how they were able to, to get it done in the midst of the war. And so this is kind of the, um, if you were alive back then and you were visiting this building, this would be your view because 
it was facing onto these narrow streets. It has two facades. So this one is facing, I think it's west. And there's also one facing south because the street kind of did an L shape and the building did as well, or does as well. So um, you would always be approaching it along this narrow street. And you would see then the, these piers almost congealing into a solid, a solid surface. But if we were to actually take a look now, and these, these links are to either <coughs> like a Google Street View, or now with, with smartphones, people can, I don't, haven't done it, I don't know how it's done, but it seems to be very easy because there's a lot of these kind of 360 panoramic immersive VR type um, photographs that are dropped into Google Maps. So anyways, so this is along the lines of that view, but you can kind of start to see that, that something is going on in the reflection. And if we pan up, you, you can see that there is this very contemporary building reflected in the window or windows, and that is Norman Foster's 30 um, you know, Swiss Ray Tower, 30 St. Mary X which is on the site of the old Baltic Exchange, which was a victim of a bombing, an IRA bombing in 1992. Um, so they, they took the building down, and when Foster designed this building, and this building is not in the book, but it gave me the opportunity to talk about uh, this in the 1916 entry, um, he kind of decided to keep this breathing room that was created by that destruction by um, um, creating a, a sizable plaza around the base of the tower. So um, here you can kind of see now that um, this view of the of Holland House that was really never a view you were going to get, not one that Berlage would have intended, is now a fact of life because of this, you know, what happened in the, the last 20 years or so. Um, this is, a, again, one of the kind of obvious buildings that um, really have to have in anything covering the last hundred years. And um, a, one interesting thing I, I learned um, while researching this was that Garrett Reitfeld, when he submitted drawings to get this approved, pretty much knew that this was a bit too avant-garde for approval, so he drew an elevation, this is, I think it's to the east, so he drew the east elevation with the neighboring building in the drawing. So if you didn't know exactly what you were looking at, you would think this, the house that he's submitting has that pitched roof <laughs> over it. Um, and he, somewhere I was reading, he admitted um, kind of, um, that was his intention. And um, one way to think about the design of it is that it's, it's at the end of this uh, block of fairly traditional uh, row houses, and the, the point lines and planes of the De Steele, uh movement that he's, he's doing is kind of dissolving that into the landscape, because beyond to the east was this polder landscape that um, and there was then, that's what looked out, or this house looked out onto, but, but now it's kind of locked in by this highway that was added. Uh, I don't remember the, the year that that came barreling through, uh, but even on the other side of it, there's a university that's been there since the late 1990s. Um, so it's kind of just, you know, that's the, the change that um, happens everywhere. Um, this I, house. Can I just um, say that um, if, if people go to Utrecht, uh, you can take a tour, an English tour of the building. Have you been on a tour? That's one I haven't been to. Phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Oh, and Tiny as it is, where everything is, um, it's like a Transformers, uh, you know, car or something. Right. Everything is something, it can be something else. It's a phenomenal building. 
Yeah, I mean, my, my picture of the interior shows it, and it's open. This is when mm -hmm. maybe three pictures would have been, would have been great, but um, you know, all these walls slide, so you have uh, either one open space on the top floor, closed rooms, you know, all these different configurations. And then it is interesting to see how um, you know, this, this house is so significant, it's actually taken over part of the old mm -hmm. row house next to it. And then, on this is a uh, Williams, and he designed it for his father, who was a famous composer. And um, I compare it in the book to Falling Water in that it it's, sits over, a, in this case, a small creek. But whereas, as Wright, kind of more idiosyncratic with the cantilevering house, this is almost like a bridge. Um, you know, a very kind of rational uh, structural solution. And you would actually walk in through this opening, stairs that would follow the curvature of the structure, and then there was one on the other side. And um, the, the house, after um, the architect's father died, uh, kind of went through, it was a, a radio station for a while, they broadcast from there, and it suffered a damage in a fire in 2004. The city, uh, the municipality, um, of Mar del Plata took it over in 2012, opened it to the public in 2013. But as you can see, this is a somebody's photo from 2014. You can see that it's still in a lot, it needs a lot of help. You can see the, the stairs coming up from, um, from below and you can um, actually kind of see the way the handrails curve down because the, the steps and the rails are following the curve of, this, of the structure. But it has this beautiful open plan facing north toward the sunlight and um, on, on this direction a kitchen wrapping around and then we can't see it from, from here but, uh, but behind the, this wall are the bedrooms and we're, again, we're in the southern hemisphere, so the sun is coming from the north, so there's actually skylight scoops that are above this casework, and then that's bringing sunlight down into the bedrooms that are on the other side of that, of that wall. Um, I, did, I did meet somebody who um, did a book, he, he has a publication called One to 100, like the architectural scale, uh, down in Argentina, and they, they did a, a monograph, it's only in Spanish though, did a monograph on this, and um, I can't pretend that my book would spur somebody to help preserve this building, but you know, with, I know he's uh, certainly interested in kind of getting that building into a better state. Um, this is one probably people here have, if not familiar with, have visited. Um, one that I've visited uh, numerous times. Um, even so, it, it does seem that uh, people are um, surprised at that that's a house. Um, you know, obviously called the glass house. Um, and if you visit, you, you know the story, but um, I pointed out in the book, but I only had the one photo, so I wasn't able to actually um, illustrate it but this is obviously the glass house or at the threshold, uh, the brick um, fireplace slash toilet room. But lesser known is the, the brick house, which was built at the same time and is kind of a inverse of the glass house by being completely solid. Um, there's a few round openings on the other side and um, this one, that's where he would, he would sleep, uh, Philip Johnson. So Philip Johnson would sometimes use the glass house as a bedroom. You know, it had a, has a bedroom inside of it. Um, but in terms of getting privacy, in the bedroom with the, there's a small office here, so around the corner is a area for, um, for the bedroom. But anyways, um, he, 
you know, he was aware of, of just how a, a glass house would put him on display, even though he had so much land um, that he built these two. But it seems even when I was learning about this house in um, architecture school, we didn't learn about the brick house. Um, but now, as far as I know, that is, if you go there for a, a tour, you cannot go inside because they, they're raising money to fix up the brick house. Um, this is one I'm just showing because I wish I could have shown the interior of this one as well. Uh, Marcel Breuer a Church for a, a Benedictine Monastery in Minnesota. Um, this was 61, so it was around the time of the Second Vatican Council, which um, I guess you could say made it official for Catholic churches to uh, go away from um, a, a church layout where you have, say, the nave, apse, and the priest facing the same direction as the congregation. Um, this uh, is a more open, You can see the altar is, is practically in the, in the middle of the church. Um, anyways, kind of the, there was a movement at that time to kind of make uh, the mass more um, kind of a, a participation with the priest. Um, and also, I would have liked to have shown this um, the stained glass wall on the on the um, north side. Um, but again, this is another case where the photo budget and being able to get um, only one photo for this building. Um, so here's a, a tall building and um, you know, I'd say there's about, you know, depending on how you define tall, say eight or ten in the book. And I always like to um, show this because, whoops. So you, you have all these trusses that create five zones within the, within the building. And um, this is in the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank by Norman Foster. So this is down at the plaza beneath the building looking up. And there's kind of this glass belly almost. And you're looking up into this atrium. And um, I'm not sure where they're installed, but there's a system of heliostats to bring light, to kind of bounce light down into the the lobby. The lobby is about three floors above this plaza. So you take these these tall escalators to get up to the lobby level. Um, but I remember kind of being um, floored by the fact that um, when I learned how this plaza space is taken over on Sundays by uh, Filipina maids that work in the, the city and this is their day off. So this is, a, again, a, a bank building. It's you know, public in the sense that people can freely move uh, through here during, during the week, but it's not such that they would be able to do this during the week. Um, but on Sundays, again, um, you know, the bank kind of um, allows, well, allows it, this to happen. That is either very early or very late, because I've been there on Sunday, and there are thousands Right, this, not, this not was, five people. yeah, here I was at the mercy of what I could find, <laughs> and I'm assuming that this is... is it's it's abs absolutely covered every inch with people, and that, and because people are, they're all women, um, and mm -hmm. because everybody's talking at the same time, it sounds like you're in a, in a pigeon, um, you know, okay. uh, a flock of pigeons, a very large flock of pigeons, because... Um, that it, it just echoes and everything up mm -hmm. there. It's amazing. Well, yeah, and I wasn't sure what was going on with these mm -hmm. um, kind of uh, railings and keeping people out of certain parts. Um, I think that's that's an again something that I I, I think I discussed that in, in the book, but can't really show that. Um, the Vitra Fire Station is is personally one that. I was in school at this time. I was in school from 91 to 96 at Kansas State. And um, so I, I was at school when postmodernism was still a thing, but um, you know, I was 18 or so years old and I 
was not interested in it at all, so I was kind of more drawn to Zaha Hadid and um, other architects with this more aggressive, um, aggressive way of designing. And this is an extremely important building for her because it's first, her first building. Um, and when I spent a semester in Italy and then did some traveling in Europe later, um, at the end of the semester, I, my friends and I got to the Vitra campus about two minutes after tickets for a tour of the fire station. Um, and this was in 1995, so it was still working as a fire station. I missed it by two minutes. The group was, was up on the other side of the gate and I was telling them, I, you know, I can run and be there. And they said, no, no. Um, so I missed then. And um, so someday I'll, I'll be able to go see it. But it's, um, Hadid had a thing for these very narrow spaces, kind of a long gate. In this case, it was, it was um, these walls and this canopy kind of reaching out into the landscape across the road from the campus this agricultural landscape, kind of along the lines of the Schroeder, uh, Reitfeld Schroeder House. Um, so when this ceased being used as a fire station, there were people writing about it, people who were not fans of Hadid's work, saying that it's because she designed an inadequate building. She designed one that could not function as a fire station. But my research yielded the, the fact that they built this as a fire station. They, I forgot to give you that story. They built it as a fire station because there was a, a, a big fire on their, um, you know, where their factories are, the Vitra uh, furniture manufacturer, uh, that destroyed a lot of their production facilities. It was in the late 80s. So um, they hired um, Alvaro Siza, Nicholas Grimshaw, the kind of the idea was, you know, we make this designer furniture. Let's kind of have a designer campus. So they were doing that, and that's why they commissioned Hadid for a fire station, which was needed because there was not one in the vicinity that could. Um, that's why the, a lot of their facilities burnt down because it took so long for for the say the fire trucks or whatever to get to the campus. So, anyways, it's. It's now being used as an exhibition hall, as you can see, but um, it was able to become an exhibition hall because uh, another town built a fire station that was close enough that they didn't need this to function as a fire station. So that kind of deflates the argument that she designed something that did not function properly. Um, and this is Alvaro Siza a Museum for a Painter. Um, Vera Camargo, or Camargo in, um, in Brazil. Uh, his first building there completed at when he was 75. And um, in the book, I compare it to the Guggenheim because it, it has this network of spirals. The Guggenheim, though, as you know, you take the elevator up and you have one path down. This one through these arms that extend out and these ramps that are on the inside of the, this wall. Um, and there's, those are two routes. So you can kind of, you can go up one way or down, whichever way you're doing it, you've got one, two, and then there's stairs kind of in another part of the, of the building. So there's three routes that you could take. Um, but like the Guggenheim, it's, it's internalized. But unlike the Guggenheim, here we're standing, um, let me go back. So we're, we're basically, we're standing kind of on this, this ramp, and it's hard to see here, kind of watched out, but these people are looking out a window. And if we look around, you can see you know, what they're, they're looking at. You have a, a river to, to the west, you can see the, the sun to the north. Um, and it's a small window. It's not even something you notice very much from the outside. The whole thing looks very solid. Um, you can kind of see it right there. Um, but just, I think maybe because it's so um, internalized, that small window really draws uh, people's attention. And uh, another interesting thing about this project is 
there was so little space on this site. You can see there's more kind of buildings here, and then that goes down. So there's courtyards. These are courtyards down to below. Um, and those link up to a parking garage that's under the, the street. So actually, um, if somewhere along here, there's a ramp going down to the parking garage that's under this, this road. It's kind of a really creative way of, of squeezing in um, more space. Just a couple more. Um, this, is, this is one that um, you could, could maybe argue that it's, that it's a landscape, um, not a building, but it, it has some underground levels. It was actually created um, by Jürgen Meyer H. Um, in Seville when there was a car park on this site and they were going to do uh, an expansion of it and they found some archaeological ruins and decided to hold a competition um, for a plaza and so his competition winning design is, is kind of um, you know, the, obviously this attention getting canopy but below um, there's an archaeological museum and then kind of a mall slash market and then this plaza level that's raised and then actually a fourth level on top so you can take an elevator up in one of the legs and come up to this um, kind of uh, walkway circuit and you can kind of see how it extends around and around And then this is the last one, uh, Mark Thal, which is uh, in Rotterdam, designed by MVRDV. A, um, I've always kind of had a, a thing for when different programs kind of collide. And I should say that a lot of, um, you know, in a lot of cases, finding out the projects, the buildings that were going to be in the book, is it's somewhat. Um, a rational process, but a lot of it was just kind of in my gut, what interested me or what felt kind of good. This one, um, this is that photo I was telling you about because the editor wasn't too excited about those the people being in that photograph, but I kind of liked how it um, showed just how um, people are drawn to this, this project because it's um, a very attention-getting, um, this artwork that's digitally printed on the underside of the building, but it is a, it's a market and apartments on the outside. So the, the market came about because it, this was a site of an open air market, but new hygiene laws in the Netherlands forced them to move it inside. So uh, the way MVRDV, a uh, Dutch firm, dealt with it was to um, kind of combine the two, so the apartments that are on the outside have views into the market. And they state that they're soundproof and smellproof um, so that um, not bothered by anything from the market. And you can see that there's more layers to this product as well. There's a supermarket and mall on the below street level, and it also connects to uh, public transit. And then above the, these market kiosks, there's uh, seating, so you can um, buy some food, go upstairs, and then sit underneath this, this huge um, mural, if you will. And there's actually apartments that are um, at the very top, and they have glass floors down into, um, into, the, into the market hall. And um, so just, I don't, I don't want to say summarize, but um, kind of the next thing that happened out, um, coming out of this book um, was, you know, one thing with, say, this, this building, the um, Salk Institute by Louis Kahn, is how important this open space is. Um, you know, and he, envisioned it having trees for a long time and it wasn't until he showed the space to Louis Barragon and Barragon said just leave it the way, leave it empty, leave it hard, don't put any trees in there. Um, so 
you know, landscape has, has kind of been something that I've been interested in. And actually, when I went to college, I went to become a landscape architect, but then switched after a couple of years into more architecture of buildings. So um, after uh, 100 Years, 100 Buildings came out, I then pitched the idea of 100 Years, 100 Landscapes to my editor, and um, they okayed that. So last year, I wrote, uh, I wouldn't call it a follow-up, but maybe call it a companion. Um, I like the idea of having pairs of things. Uh, I actually, someday, I don't know when, I, I've written a book of contemporary Chicago architecture that could kind of go along with the New York book, and that's hopefully going to come out next year. Um, and so there's that pair, and then there's this pair. So I was able then to put in my lens Vietnam Memorial uh, Eros Saarinen's um, Gateway Arch, but also because landscape is kind of generalized as landscape designs, you can put in Storm King Art Center, for instance, and other projects. So it's not just about landscape architecture, which is, say, a, a narrow slice. It's not just land art. It's not just, um, um, you know, sculpture parks. It's all these various things that are kind of um, design landscapes. So um, this should be out in the fall and then you know, maybe <laughs> be back for another talk. So, try it out. Um, Once if there are any questions from the audience? Are there any questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is the painted mural that you just showed us uh, paint on, on aluminum siding? Is that what it is? Or? Well, it's, it's digitally printed. I don't, it could very well be aluminum. I'm not positive about that detail, but it's, it's a, um, they weren't up there painting, so it was probably printed on these individual panels and then put into, put into place. And looking up, though, the, um, the artist's name, because I don't remember their names off the, the top of my head, um, Arno Conan and Iris Roskam. It's a 118,000 square foot vault. So it's a, and you can see, um, that's still up. You can see it's very specific to the, the space. It has these oversized butterflies, um, flowers, fruits, vegetables, and so on. So your presentation suggests that you think that the book format isn't necessarily adequate in order to explain the buildings. Um, what's, what's the conundrum about making a book? You know, it, um, there's a few. Um, I mean, I'll admit I wasn't intending to convey that. <laughs> um, it was more, if partly my thinking was, um, in, in the introduction I call this 100 miniature case studies or a hundred invitations to go visit these buildings. So this was a way to kind of visit them um, virtually and to see some of the things that are discussed in the project. But like you were saying, uh, intro here, that um, doing the one project, one spread, um, you know, you've got 500 words, you've got one page text, one page image, and you can't really do um, much, say, doing four images on the page to be able to convey that. Um, I mean, I, it's, it's funny because I, another one of my favorite types of books are case studies, which book length case studies. And um, I don't have a bibli the bibliography in this book is kind of a general bibliography, it's a lot, and much, you know, these kind of books that I showed earlier. But I, on my blog, I have a uh, PDF that shows year by year what were my main references. And I always searched out these book length case studies. Because um, I, I, I feel like maybe not all buildings, but a lot of buildings are worth diving into that level of detail and pre presenting all these drawings and photographs and construction photos and so on. Um, so. The biggest conundrum then is space. Mm -hmm. What can you do? And so I guess really my question is, what, what's the what's the virtue of a book if 
you know, the virtual experience, it right. seems to be, you know, so much more complete um, in terms of, of getting a sense of the space of the building or the context of the building. What, what makes a book a, a better vehicle to talk to make this selection and memorialize it in, in a way than, than a blog where you could, you could make the links and you could narrate it, you know, maybe it would be more multimedia or in a blog. What, what's the virtue of a book in, a, in your right. view? Um, I mean, one virtue, not, not necessarily as a book, but one virtue of just kind of this overview is having the variety, having these 100 buildings. Um, but I'm somewhat old fashioned in that I like being able to flip back and forth in a book. So if you have 100 projects in one book, and you want to be able to compare and contrast or look and see how these things are kind of, um, what, what happens as you flip through the book in chronological order. Um, or in the introduction, I talk about some of these, some few themes that I discovered as I was writing the book, and there's many that could be found that these things or have these things in common. Um, but it seems on a, on a website, you're, you're kind of, you're looking at this one thing and the rest of it is just, it's not there. So a book, it kind of enables all of it to kind of be together. I mean, that's how I like to interact with a book at least. So, I don't know about you, but. Did each year have a lot of difficult runners up that you had to decide against? Yeah, and you can see, you could see the ones that came out here are, are ones that, you know, these are the runners up over here. Um, yeah, it was difficult in, in a lot of cases, but it's, um, that's when things like some diversity came into play. So if, if this is a Corbu building and there's already five in there, I think we can do without, without you know, those sorts of, sorts of things. Um, but then you have these years where there's no runner up. So those were the, the tricky years. Um, you know, I, I was so happy to find uh, Buckminster Fuller's uh, Dymaxion dwelling machine, which was completed in Wichita in 1946, a year when nothing was completed just about anywhere. Um, and find out that it was moved to the Henry T. Ford Museum in Michigan and is now on display as part of their, um, part of their, um, part of the museum. So it was, for me, 1946 was the important date because that's when he wanted to take factories for aircraft, turn them over into factories for mass-produced housing. But then he was stubborn and he said, I'm not done, I need to spend more time on it, meaning like 20 more years. <laughs> and his investors and people said, no, no we're not gonna do that. And there were orders for all these houses, but he felt like he needed to perfect all these details. And um, nevertheless, it's, it's one of the projects in the book. So. I know I wanna know for my own reasons, but I, um, I have a feeling that the non-authors in the audience might be interested to know what the budget was for the illustrations. I think I can say. Um, it was, well, it was 5,000, and um, I was, I went over that, <laughs> and that's yeah. what made me happy about this, this because they like can This seems like very little. You must have gotten quite a lot for free then. Um, I, yes. I, you know, it was a mix of, of people that I knew through my blog. Um, people are the, uh, the HABs at Library of Congress, I'm trying to remember the, what that stands for. Um, Historic American Building Survey. Yeah, and you know, like, uh, mm -hmm. buildings like Falling Water. Um, try, oh. Drawing a blank on the woman's uh, photographer's name, but she donated all her, um, all her photographs and so there are things like that. And um, so, but, but with the German edition, the, the budget went up to 7,500. 
Yeah. So that was that was helpful. The landscape book, there's no German edition. Um, the publisher was a, kind of like, you know, buildings mm -hmm. sell fairly well, landscapes not so much. Nevertheless, we both, my editor and I, mm -hmm. both wanted to do a landscape book. It's kind of something when you look at a lot of illustrated books, the publisher's catalogs, you don't see many. So um, anyways, so that one stayed down at five and relied more on Wikimedia Commons, creative. Um, you were very cle clever because um, I mean, it's, it's very common for the commercial publish, uh, photographers, Esto or you know, sort of any of those to charge $500,000, $1,500 for a single image. Yeah, and it, it, like I had the same problem or the same things to deal with on the New York book. I, would, I was able to take photos for that because the city I live in, I could go around and take photos. But um, with, with that one, I sometimes had to go for Esto photos. And luckily, I worked out a, a deal because I was using so many. But also, they're this big on the page. <laughs> yeah. These are, you can see, they're full page or half page. So mm -hmm. if you are able, if you're using, like, this is from View, which is a um, UK, like a UK Esto. And uh, there's a lot of View photos in here. So again, it was, there were so many that the cost was more realistic. But it also meant that I had to hit that target. You know, if I didn't hit the target, the, the price per photo went up. So I really had to mm -hmm. make sure I was getting enough. And, but then when I looked for their landscape photos, they, they had none of the projects that were in my book. So it's mm -hmm. exclusively buildings. Well, if there are no other questions, I would suggest that you take a, a look at many more pages of the book because the photographs really are very beautiful. Um, and, uh, and it was fascinating to hear about how you made your decisions. And so let's thank John. Thank you. So um, the Skyscraper Museum has been here for, since, since um, 2004 in this space. And we do two exhibitions every year. This one called Tenant Taller. Um, Manhattan, all, all buildings in Manhattan that were 10 stories or taller from 1874, the first one, the Tribune building until 1900, is in its last few weeks. Um, we, in, in doing two a year, we like to alternate between contemporary and historic topics. Uh, international, local, national, the, the whole gamut is, is part of the purview of the Skyscraper Museum, and we like to uh, think that our author's talks also take uh, a slice across a, a whole range of topics, New York City history, New York City architecture, world architecture and urbanism, um, and, um, and history and world architecture, which is really the subject for this evening. Um, this is actually John Hill's second talk at the museum because his first one was about this book, The New York City Architecture, a Contemporary Guide. Um, I'm not, I don't know if you're familiar um, with this very handy, very portable, and um, useful guide to recent architecture in the city. But John had the idea um, to do this because there, there wasn't a book that covered recent uh, architecture in town, and so beautifully um, illustrated and, and written in you know, nice color photographs. So this book is also available in the bookstore, and if you want to, um, you want to get one, um, you'll, you'll be able to benefit from um, John's really uh, vast and what and timely knowledge of the contemporary scene in New York because you know, some of you now probably know his blogs on uh, a daily dose of architecture and a weekly dose of architecture and world architecture which uh, which he edits uh, um, an e-magazine of contemporary design and I have to give my own opinion about that that work on the web. Uh, it is um, beautifully conceived, it's beautifully written, um, it's gorgeously illustrated, and it's a really, I think, astonishingly up to the minute on um, recent books, recent buildings, 
in a way that's, that's pretty amazing for one person who's putting all of this stuff together. Uh, and, uh, and I have to say I'm also very um, impressed with uh, the book that, um, for our subject tonight, 100 Years, 100 Buildings. And John has a way of mastering and organizing materials and then communicating it. And um, while uh, I'll say something which is a, um, a critical in the sense that uh, it's not critical of the book, but it's about criticism um, of, of books and of publishing. The easiest kind of book to do is a one building, one page <laughs> write up. And, and histories, which is what I aspire to write, um, are very difficult and time consuming and take you know, 10 or 20 or you know, 20 years in order to produce a, very, a, a book which is um, thinner than this. Uh, so, but that's not to undermine the enormously um, fun and engaging process that John's going to talk about tonight about how you actually survey the, uh, the world of architecture and then think about how you make a decision about one building versus another building. Although in 1931, even though I would love to live in the Villa Savoie, if I had picked one domicile it would, that I, you know, ideally I could, I could um, have in, in my dreams, it would be to live in the Villa Savoie. But 1931 belongs to the Empire State Building, there's no question about that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, so John is going to talk about that, that process. Uh, I just want to uh, also mention, well, his, uh, some of his biography, so you know from, from whence he comes. Ooh, I picked up the wrong book because I had notes in the back of the one that I was looking at, so I will, maybe it's this one. I remember that he went to Kansas State University um, where he studied architecture, and then he went to Chicago for 10 years to work with architects, uh, and then he came to New York in order to study urban planning at the City College of New York. Um, was that with Michael Zirkin? Yeah. A very excellent writer, by, by the way, Michael Zirkin, um, and an interesting architect. Uh, and um, what else about that? Um, so so he, he took a master's in, uh, in urban planning at, at City College. And I think I said all the things that I wrote down, but uh, the, the one thing that I wanted to mention, besides being a good and clear writer and an excellent photographer, because most of the the images that he uses on his blog, an awful lot of them he's taken himself, which is extraordinary. Uh, but I wanted to mention that he's also, uh, he has a, a very curious eye and intelligence because in the research that we were doing for our, our upcoming exhibition that, uh, on Lower Manhattan in the 1990s, we are updating a, um, a historic marker that was written about the John John Street Methodist Church over on John Street. Uh, that was, uh, was an early 19th century, mid 19th century church in New York. And we were thinking about it and, and trying to find what happened in the last 20 years or so there and came across John's blog about the public space that's on either side of the church. And it was the only thing that I'd seen written about it other than the Landmarks Preservation Report. And here, just reading what John had to say was that he walked past this church every day and he began to think about it because it was on his way, I guess, to the subway that was part of the Philip Johnson public space, like where you go down the two and the three train, like you go down um, through the Federal Plaza Annex building. And, um, and I thought, well, you know, what an extraordinary thing to not just wonder about a building, but then probe about it and then write about it about something which is as, well, kind of inconsequential as those two little, but yet interesting, as those two little slivers of space have been created on either side of the church. So um, it, as a historian and an academic, I have to say hats off to John for, for thinking about stuff like that and putting it down. So now we're, we're, we, we have, that was the microscopic the, um, the micro view of New York ur urbanism, and now we're going to get the macro view of uh, 100 years of architecture in the world. John. 